Genesis 8. There are, there are parts to music, and every part has a place. There's melody, that's the songs that we sing, harmony that goes with it, rhythm. There has to be rhythm to a song. It has to be organized in beats. Now, I've had even some preachers say that syncopated beats are of the devil, and I just I don't, don't see that in the Bible. Um, there's nothing wrong with hitting a note before the beat comes on. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but everything has its place. And I think the main, there's a part of music called color, tone color. You can either make a bright song or you can make a deep, dark song with the music. And uh, in some cases, some music's just too, you can hear it and say, that's just too dark. So anyway, Genesis chapter 8, are you glad to be alive and in the Lord? Say amen. I uh, appreciate uh, some of the comments that came in about this morning's message. Um, I have been, I mean, I guess this is just the way God makes people, uh, but I've been, a, I've been a patriot all my life as a young man. I loved my country, I would have served in the military had God led me in that direction. Uh, I don't know that I'd be good at it, but I would have done it. And um, the first chance I got to vote, I guarantee you I didn't vote for Walter Mondale. Guarantee you I didn't. And that was uh, Reagan's second election. And I was glad, I was glad to vote for him. And we had a, 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 believe it or not, we had a professor in a conservative Bible college that was an ardent Southern Democrat. And when he voted, he voted straight Democrat. He just punched the Democrat hole and everybody that was a Democrat, he got his vote. And I can remember being 18 years old and I'm going, that ain't right. You realize what he stands for? And that was back in the 80s. And um, he got some criticism, but nothing was ever done. And I can remember Brother Sterling, they made the mistake one year, put me on a committee. In the Free Will Baptist denomination, one of the meetings we had. So it was a resolution committee. And it was just things, that, issues that we brought up that we were given like a vote of confidence on certain issues. Well, there was something coming up in that election, a ballot issue, and it had to do with taxation, had to do with uh, giving power to the people over certain taxation. And of course, all the government people were arguing against it because they wanted more power to tax people. And they were saying, we're all these government agencies going to have to be shut down. So I, I remember bringing it up on the committee saying, I think we ought to vote and stand in... in in favor of passing this particular amendment. And a certain pastor said, well, we don't want to necessarily do that. That might rock the boat a little bit. So I went, okay, I see how it goes. So Sterling, you can ask me who that was after church tonight. You know him. Genesis 8. Let's read. First five verses, and then uh, I'll show you something in a minute. Anyway, Genesis chapter 8, good to have you with us. Appreciate you all being here this afternoon. And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped. The rain from heaven was restrained and the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, I think that's an important time prophecy. I do. I think the 150 days is something that is going to be seen again. In fact, I could prove it simply by directing you to Revelation chapter 9. It is a five month period. And during that five-month period, something happens that is 
never happened on earth before. These devils are released out of the pit. They have stings on their tails. They appear as locusts, but they have the tails of scorpions. They are a sort of a hybrid breed. I guarantee you there's a lab somewhere working on that right now. But they have stings in their tails. Generally, a sting represents the sting of death. Well, they are stung by that. And everybody that is stung does not, they become temporarily immortal. For five months, nobody dies. Now that's impossible. That's never happened before. There are people dying right this minute. I just snapped my fingers. Probably five people in the world died just now. People are dying all the time in this earth. But during this five months, nobody dies. They want to die. Nobody does. They are tortured and tormented and are in extreme pain. They want to die. But actually, here's what I think. I think God gives them what they asked for. Man is seeking immortality. They want to do it without the cross. They want to do it without the gospel. So God's going to let them achieve that. And for five months, nobody's going to die on this earth. And I think it serves a purpose. Because then that raises the issue of the king of the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 9. So to me, this 150 days, I think it plays out once again. The ark rested, verse 4, the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month. There's that number again, that date again. Upon the mountains of Ararat, and the waters decrease continually until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We believe every word in this book. We are comforted by it. We are blessed by it. We are warned by it. We are chastised by it. We are corrected by it. And Father, we live by this word. And God, there are religious zealots all over the world. But Father, we love your word so much, we don't want to live without it. And we couldn't live without it. It is our daily bread. It is the water of life. It is what our soul desires. It is what we hunger and thirst for. And Father, we just couldn't make it without this book. And Father, I've, I love seeing the order that you put everything in, and I'm thankful, God, that I, I'm still amazed at how perfect and how orderly and structured this book really is. And I am confident, God, that you are the author of this divine book. The Bible says that you're the author and finisher of our faith, and our faith comes from your word. So, Father, increase our faith. We live in troubling times. Days, Father, that we don't know from one day to the next whether life is going to go well or life is going to go bad. So, Father, we are the people, God, who have put our trust in you and in your word. We pray, dear God, that you'd bless us tonight. Give us wisdom. Give us sound knowledge. Give us understanding the times that we live in. Help us, dear God, each one in our own life to serve you and to honor you with everything we are and everything we have. And we love you and we ask your blessings now upon our meeting. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. I, I've mentioned this uh, before that the Genesis chapter follow a pattern clearly laid out in the Bible. The numbers mean something in each individual chapter, like the number seven is God's number for completion. And it's in chapter 7, God finishes the world. He ends the world. The world that was then is over with. God has eliminated all the wickedness off the earth. He's cleansed the earth with water. And so now God is giving the world a second chance. Sort of like a second birth. And that's what the number 8 represents. It represents a second chance at... Forgiveness, a second chance at mercy, uh, a, a new life, a new beginning. 
for anyone who's ever wanted the opportunity to start over again, the gospel gives you that opportunity. Amen? You got to... I mean, John, are you different now than you were 20 years ago? Is he different, Melissa? Oh, yeah. Most ways. All right? Okay? God's still working on him. Amen? Okay? But it's that second chance that God gave us all. And God's given the earth now here a second chance. The, and so that's what the number eight means. You have seven days in a week. The week starts all over again. Eight is the number for new beginnings, new life, the new heavens and the new earth that's coming. And I want you to draw your attention to something. Look at verse, and I had this in my notes, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show it to you now. Uh, look at verse 21. Let's see here. Genesis 8. Is that where I want to be? Maybe I need to get in my notes here. Verse 18 actually is where I want. Notice this. Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him. We know from 2 Peter, 1 Peter, that there's, these are eight people in the 8th chapter of the Bible coming off the ark. And I want you to notice verse 19. Every beast, every creeping thing, every fowl, whatsoever creepeth upon the earth, after their kinds went forth out of the ark. Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. Notice verse 22 and count with me. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. Eight things. Now, who put that there? God did. God is a God of order. You see eight people in the eighth chapter and eight things that God blesses in this chapter. God has sort of given you a second and even a third witness to what this number eight represents. It is a new life, a new start and a new beginning. What is the eighth book of the Bible? And I'll give you a minute to count it. You guys are doing this. Eighth book of the Bible. I'll turn there. Ruth. Turn to the book of Ruth. And I love this. Two books in the Bible named after women. What's the other one? Esther. Okay, I turned. I went way past it. Ruth. What is the story of Ruth about? Actually, the story of Ruth is not so much about Ruth. Who's it about, really? Look at chapter one, uh, verse two. There was a man by the name of Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the name of his two sons. Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. These are Gentile brides now. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth, and they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them, and the women was left of her two sons and her husband. So, she, according to the law, Naomi was to have the inheritance passed down to her two sons because of, of her dead husband. Then her two sons were to hand their inheritance down to their firstborn offspring. But because now both of those men have died, there is no one to claim the inheritance of Elimelech. It goes sort of into legal limbo. It's like... Someone who dies and does not leave a, a proper will or some, some method of giving all of their stuff over to someone they know or someone who's related to them, it ends up in probate court. And that, that takes a long time for a judge to figure out who's going to get what. And it could be contested for years. So the inheritance that was supposed to be handed down from Elimelech to Malin and Chilion and then to their sons, now hangs in limbo, and there's no one to redeem it. 
And Naomi now is stuck. She's a woman, and according to the law, she doesn't have the right to redeem that property. She can't give it to Ruth. Ruth is a Gentile woman. So it's stuck, and there's no one there to claim the inheritance. So here's Naomi. And Naomi, let me tell you, Naomi represents Israel. But she also represents us who we've come to a place in our life where we were bankrupt. We had nothing. God and sin wiped us out completely. Blessed, this is why Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so you come to Christ morally bankrupt, spiritually bankrupt. You have nothing to offer. And yet Christ redeems you, gives you a brand new life all over again. Somebody say amen. By the way, the word redeem. Guess how many times it's in the book of Ruth? That'd be eight times. I counted. So now look in uh, chapter four. I'm not going to read all of this, but in Ruth chapter four, this is now Naomi's new life. And it's through, if Naomi represents Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, who does Ruth represent? She's a Gentile. She represents the church. The Gentile bride of the Redeemer. And notice that it is through Ruth that Naomi now receives the new life. Through the child that is, that is born of Boaz, who is the kinsman Redeemer. If you look in... Um, Verse 5 of chapter 4, Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. Israel right now is dead. The Jewish people are dead in trespasses and sins. It's sort of like when Ezekiel prophesied to the dry bones the first time, they came together... Bone joined bone, sinew upon sinew, flesh upon the bone in the sinew, but they're still dead. They're no life. Israel right now as a nation has been gathered together out of all the places in the world, brought into the land again, but they're still dead. They know not the gospel. They don't know the Messiah. They don't know who Jesus is and they're still dead. That's why uh, Ezekiel had to prophesy to them the second time. And what that represents is guess what? New Testament. And when he prophesies the second time, he prophesies to the four winds, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they breathe life into, and, and that, that army stands up again, and that is the army of God. It is the people of Israel given new life. They're raised back from the dead. Elimelech is going to live again through Boaz and Ruth and their marriage and joining together, and they have a son. Take a look at... Um, verse 13. Man, I love this. In fact, look at verse uh, 10. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren, and from the gate of his place ye are witnesses this day. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is coming to thine house like Rachel and like Leah. Think about that. Which two did build the house of Israel and do thou worthily in Ephrata to be famous in Bethlehem. There is a child going to be born in Bethlehem that's going to be famous. Amen. 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 Hey, look at that. And verse 12, and let thy house be like the house of Pharez. Whom Tamar bare unto Judah of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. I like this. So Boaz took Ruth as she was his wife. And when he went unto her, the Lord gave her conception and she bare a son. And the woman said unto Naomi, blessed be the... Watch this. Follow this baby. This baby is Christ's second coming. That, blessed be the Lord which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a what? That's what the number eight means. A restorer. How many of you had your life restored? 
For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. So if Ruth is better than seven sons, and she bears a son, what number is he? You get it. Verse 16, And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a, a, a son born to Naomi. They called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now watch this. Count. Count this in your Bible. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez, watch this now. He's number one, begat Hezron. Hezron begat Ram. Ram begat Aminadab. Aminadab begat Nashon. Nashon begat Salmon. Salmon begat Boaz. Boaz begat... What number am I holding up? Eight. But then, Obed begat Jesse. Jesse begat David. Now we're at ten. Ten's the number for the king. David the king was the grandchild of a half-Jewish, half-Gentile little boy named Obed who restored the life of Naomi. I believe that God has raised up the Gentile church to hold in store the inheritance for the people of Israel. What an honor. Are you kidding me? God, the apple of God's eye is the people of Israel. And God has called us puny little hillbilly redneck heathen Gentiles, wicked heathen Gentiles, sinners, to be the custodians of the inheritance for the people of Israel that God is going to save in the last days. That's an honor. It is an honor to be trusted with that. Somebody say amen. Man, I love this Bible. Um, now, let's do this. Uh, we covered that. Genesis 8, 20, verse 22. Now turn to Leviticus 12. Turn to Leviticus 12. You remember I was teaching this this morning about circumcision. What day was the man-child to be circumcised? Eighth day. Now, I've been told that when a child is born, their immune system has to adapt to this new environment they're in. And I've been told that on or about the eighth day after birth, the child's immune system is at its strongest peak. So that when that child then is circumcised, there is little danger to the child being infected by some bacteria or something like that because their immune system has grown and adapted to the new world that they're living in and their immune system is strongest on the eighth day. Now, I believe that, but I don't think that's the sole reason why God picked that number. He picked that number as a symbol. He, did, he could have said, do it on the seventh day. That would mean maybe it's holy. Uh, do it on the fifth day. That could mean like being changed to transformation. But he picked the eighth day because it represents new life and a new beginning. So Leviticus 12, verse 1, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed and born a man-child, then shall she be unclean seven days. According to the days of the separation for her infirmity, shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Mary took Jesus according to the law on the eighth day and had him circumcised to fulfill the royal law of God. Jesus was the one who was going to give the world a brand new start. Amen to that. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Let's learn what that circumcision is really all about. Now remember, the Jerusalem council met to specifically discuss whether or not the Gentiles 
should carry on this tradition, this commandment. And it was understood then that the circumcision made with hands is not really the one that redeems mankind. It is the circumcision made without hands. In other words, the one that God does. I had an opportunity this, this afternoon after the church service. Uh, I don't think he'll mind me saying this. Robert came to me and, and he wanted to talk about some things going on in his life. I have sort of watched him and watched him grow in faith and grow in his love for the word of God. And there in my office, he bowed and confessed his sins to God and asked Jesus into his heart. And I asked him, I said, did you ask God to forgive your sins? He said, yes. I said, you believe Jesus lives in your heart? He said, yes. I said, I don't know how to tell you this, but you're a Christian. So I hate to break it to you. But, and Trish said, I've been seeing this coming for a long time. And he's been like this for, for a long time now. I said, I believe it. So we're going to talk to him about baptism. Amen. Hey, God's still saving people. He's still saving sinners. If you would have known Robert, shoot, if Robert would have known you guys. Amen. Ephesians 2. Look at verse 10. In fact, back up two verses. For by grace are you saved through faith. I got to throw that in. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And he's specifically speaking about the works of the law. And it's, and it's not the circumcision made with hands that saves anybody. Neither is it the baptism made with hands that cleanses anybody. That's done by God and by God alone. Somebody say amen. I, I'm going to work on that song and sing it. God and God alone. I love it. Now verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath ordained, before ordained, that we should walk in them. Josiah, everything that has gone on in your life, up to this day, God knew about it. Before the foundation of the world. What's going to happen tomorrow? You don't have a clue, do you? Who does? God does. You're going to follow him, amen? What choice? Do you, I mean, you do have a choice. But, yeah, wherever you turn, that's, that God, that's God, amen? He gets it. So verse 11, Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision, in other words, the Jews in the flesh made by hands. So the Jews call us the uncircumcised. Remember what David said to Goliath? You uncircumcised Philistine. Who are you to defile the army of the living God? I mean, that was a blast he made to him. Well, it's not some friendly statement he made to Goliath. So verse 12, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus. Ye who were sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. So does circumcision do that? No, a thousand times no it doesn't because that's made by man. Look at Philippians chapter 3. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Like two pages over, three pages. Mm-mm-mm. Philippians 3. It's a sign on everybody's front porch. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Who's he talking about? The Jews. They are the concision, with scission. They are the circumcision. They are the ones who would say to you, you're not honoring God if you're not circumcised and you're not keeping the law. That's why he's telling you this. Beware of them. So all of you people out there listening to me, don't fall for this Hebrew roots, Jewish name nonsense. Don't fall for it. It's a trap. For we are the circumcision. Now how is that possible? Which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So what is the circumcision that he's talking about? It is the elimination 
of this flesh. The whole thing. While in the Old Testament, it was just a piece of skin. In the New Testament, it is the entire flesh body that is excised off to free our spirit. Okay? So verse, um, verse 4, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh... If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Now, we, now Paul's going to dig up his past. And he's going to say, look at me. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews. That's what he used to be. And he's like, I was big snuff back then. As touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, Persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, he said. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Stop for a minute. By the way, that's verse 8. Stop for a minute, and I want you to think now of all the things that you physically possess. I want you to think of your car, your house, all the furniture, your bank account, and any family that you can call your own. Where is all of it headed? The dung heap. The fire. Everything that I right now possess, my house, my car, my glasses, my watch, my phone, my computer, my wife, my bed, I love my bed, my couch, I love my home, I'm going to lose every bit of it. I'm not taking any of it with me. When I pass from this life to the next. If you put your trust and your confidence on those things, you are a loser. Because everybody loses them. Jeffrey Epstein, his wealth. By the way, what did he do for a living? Not a thing. Not a thing. He was the richest unemployed man in the world. What companies did he run? What companies did he build? He stole Les Wexner's money, part of it, used that as leverage to gain him more income, and then he used extortion, I believe, out of very wealthy, powerful people in this world to get more gain from them. His... His assets, when he died, were valued at $570 million. I won't even earn a million dollars. In my lifetime, I will never do that. $570 million. And what did he take with him? What's he got with him now in hell? Nothing. He was a rich, perverted Jew that died an agonizing death. And he's in hell right now. Lost every bit of it. He put his trust in his money. He thought that his money and the fact that he had dirty secrets on people like Bill Clinton, he thought that was, gonna, that was his get out of jail free card. Prince Andrew couldn't even save him. Okay? So that's, that, here's, here's Paul. He said, I count it for loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. What do you have to give up in order to have Christ? Everything. Everything. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. But that which, and Paul just made the case now, if anybody could attain eternal life through self-righteousness, it would have been me. Paul just made that case. 
Now, I don't know how accurate his statement was, but according to the law, he considered himself blameless. And yet, in Romans 7, he calls himself, O oh, wretched man that I am. But he said, But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. God gave him, and that's why he mentioned himself being circumcised on the eighth day. He's using that to show, I am now a completely different and new man. I mean, think about it. The old Paul, Saul, was going to kill Christians. He was going to have them arrested, brought back to Jerusalem for a mock trial, and they were to be killed. Paul was holding the coats. Remember of the men who stoned Stephen? Saul was holding their coats for them. He was just as complete. I guarantee you, for all of Paul's life, he remembered Stephen being stoned to death while he's watching. And that impacted him. That changed him. And he probably thought about that every day of his life and wept. God, why did I do that? Stephen was a godly man. Why did I do that? And yet God fulfilled his righteousness in him. Colossians chapter 2. Next chapter over. Next book over. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Chapter 2, verse 10. Ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. That's what, it, that's what I just referred to. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Remember, the, it was the high priest, or the priest, the Levites, who did all the circumcisions for the people of Israel. To this day, it's the Levites. But now, Christ being a priest of a different order of priest. Not of the order of Levi, but of the order of Melchizedek, who I believe was an angel. Okay, The angelic order of priesthood, Christ is the high priest of that. He's the one personally, him personally, does the circumcision of the body. Removing the body of sins off of us. Verse 12. Buried with him in baptism. This is why we dunk them. You can't bury somebody with a splash. Amen. Buried with him in baptism. Wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, mean, means be made alive again, together with him, having forgiven you all, underline that word, all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, meaning the commandments. Thou shalt um, shal not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not uh, commit adultery, thou shalt not covet. All of those commandments, including the fourth one that Ellen White said wasn't, She's lying. All of them blotted out, nailed to the cross. So that the condemnation, where there's no law, there's no condemnation. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which is contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. I believe Jesus was showing the death of his enemies. That crown of thorns, to me, depicts the man of sin, the son of perdition. Who, when they made the movie about the exorcist, not the exorcist, the omen. Which is a movie about the Antichrist. You remember what the Antichrist boy's last name was? That was his first name, Damien. What was his last name? Thorn. Thorn. Who do you think named him that? How do you think they figured that out? Somebody who wrote that script knew what they were talking about. He was the thorn, a messenger of Satan. Nailed his enemies to the cross with him. He's like Samson saying, let me die with the Philistines. And he killed more of his enemies in his death than he did his life. Amen. Triumphing over them in the cross. Man, I love this Bible. That's it. I'm done.